Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's difficult to, um, to speak um, after the three people that already went in front of me. So my only consolation is that according to Indian protocol, if I speak last, I'm the most senior one. Um, yeah, CK, thank you very much. Look, uh, I actually you know, had prepared notes for you, but, but based on what was just said, I, I actually, I'm not gonna um, speak based on the, on the prepared notes um, because colleagues have just raised, um, I think, very important issues, both from the government side and industry side. Which, uh, which is quite illustrative to, to the process we see happening in India today, which is quite accelerated. And compared to many other countries, um, it is at a much faster pace. Now, you living in India may not notice it um, or, or have a benchmark to compare against. But trust me where I say that um, because of the unique combination of issues that exist in your country, the size, the population, the level of development, the technological um, juggernaut that we are experiencing literally as we speak, um, but also the future economic and business models that are available uh, to India. It is happening here quicker, on a bigger scale, um, and with some unique innovations that do not yet exist in many other places in the world, which is why I always say when I speak that the development solutions of tomorrow are being born in India today. But let me, let me remind you of what my Secretary General said, and, and that um, comment, uh, that phrase which he pronounced at the, at the summit when the Sustainable Development Goals were signed, um, it, it I think will always stick in my mind. And, and he said something very, very simple. We are the first generation that can end poverty, right? And of course he was referring to the, the, the finances and the technology and, and, and you know, the increased ability of countries to deal with this. He then said, but we are the last generation to save the planet. So I think the difference between the MDGs and all, all the development uh, decades that India and other countries have gone through since independence, you know, for the last 60, 70 years, depending on the country, um, is all very nice and well, but what distinguishes the moment in time when we're speaking here together is precisely the fact that we actually have a deadline that we can only guess about. And I think CK was, was, was quite clear about this, that we know it's getting bad, we, we can project some of the models, but we certainly do not know how it's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen, and who's gonna suffer most. But situations, uh, I mean, most analysis indicate that countries including India, that are located in the southern belt, in the warmer climates, will perhaps disproportionately suffer. So our need to adapt here in India is perhaps even higher than in other places in the world. Which does not mean, as CK rightly said, that we need to sacrifice our, our, our right to develop. By no means when, when they say in the UN that we are looking at India to lead the way are we indirectly or directly placing responsibility for the success of this agenda on India disproportionately? Not at all. India has the right to develop, but the simple truth of the matter is that India, compared even to China, because of its unique characteristics, its lack of some natural resources, its density of the population, its geographic location, its history, where it's starting from, cannot take the road that other countries took. And a prosperity for an Indian and the quality of life for an Indian will look dramatically different than a quality of life of a Californian, which doesn't mean an Indian has less right to live well, to send his children to school, to, to live in a good house, to have a proper job. No, it is just the model of how that achieved will be dramatically different, simply because if India achieves the um, level of living and quality of life of a California, the planet will just implode. I think that, that's, that's a numerical truth. So what is in front of India today, and which rightly so, as was said by, 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 by the previous speakers, is embodied in the SDG agenda 
is the need to innovate and to do things differently. Because if we do it traditionally, the achievement of the SDG agenda in India will take 150 years, right? So if we do it differently here in India, it may take 15. But the solutions will not be the ones that were there before. For instance, CK just referred to one of the priorities of the, of the, of the Ministry of the Environment, uh, which is the thermal comfort, right? Not only is it the right of, of, of uh, Indian and increasing middle class in India to have a controlled climate at home, at work, and increasingly be less exposed to 45, 47, God forbid, 50 degree temperatures in some parts of India and maybe in the coming decades. How that thermal comfort is achieved is the big question here for industry. On a very personal aside, I am building a house for myself right now in, in Europe. And compared to the technologies and the models that people were using in 1990 to build a house for oneself, for, for a family of, of you know, um, man and wife and kids visiting and, 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 you know, a few visitors coming here and there, the consumption of electricity is 90% lower today than it was when people were designing houses in 1990. As a matter of fact, Siki was referring to air conditioners. I bet you that in 10 years, industry will not be talking about air conditioners. As a matter of fact, my house does not involve an air conditioner, even though the climate is close to northern India, where I'm building it. Because technologies are coming to the fore that allow us to consume 10% of the energy while achieving the same comfort of living and the temperature of the environment by using air and ground thermal pumps, by using uh, ground uh, underfloor heating and cooling, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which consume a fraction of the energy. Now, here's the good news. India is actually, like it or not, I mean, certainly not good news for, for, for those in India who are still poor and, and marginalized, but the good news for the country is that compared even to China, India is catching that moment in time where it can actually do it better, quicker, cheaper, more efficiently than anybody else among the, the big states. A simple fact is that in the next 15 years, India will, will build 50% of its housing and 60% of its infrastructure in the coming years. What materials we use in that housing and in that infrastructure how resilient to climatic events, temperature, earthquakes, floods, storms, do we make it? What longevity we give to that home? And we're not talking only about the middle classes who can increasingly afford it. We're talking about even social housing. We're talking about urban infrastructure. Most of the cities of India will be built in the coming 15 years. I bet you in 10 years in this room, you will not be having a conversation about poverty because it will not exist in today's terms. We will have a new definition for poverty. A person in a rural area who does not have access to the internet and cannot exercise his or her right to government services through the mobile phone will be partially a new definition of poverty. But in today's terms of people going hungry, not being dressed, not, you know, not having the basic utilities and necessities of life will not exist in 10, 15 years. That's how quickly the world is changing, and a lot of it is because of what corporations are doing. Look, let's be frank. 70, 80% of the global economy is run by companies, corporations, private sector. You employ the absolute majority of the people in the world. So a lot of this progress is being driven by you. I think what is different today is that I think even in India, we finally reconciled the debate between development and sustainability. I think increasingly people, including led by you, I'm actually pleasantly surprised by the sophistication and the level of uh, conversation and the language and the dialogue that we're having with, 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 with the corporate sector in India. It's, it's highly advanced compared to what we were hearing all over the world, even in the north, in the developed countries, 10 years ago, these are sophisticated conversations. But what Indian 
um, private sector, I think, has been delivering and can deliver in the future is this innovation whereby we know that the Indian state cannot afford the public investments that are required to achieve the SDGs. What are the innovative win-win models where government creates the policy framework, including in consultation with business, and says, can we repeat the success of what happened in our pharma industry, in our solar industry, in our lead lights um, subsector, and many others, hopefully soon in housing? And can we find a win-win combination where a lot of these development solutions are actually not public financed, but are economically viable and profitable, at least moderately profitable for the, for the, for the social impact cases? so that a lot of this can be done by business, with business, in a sustainable manner. Look, there will always be sectors like health and education where government needs to continue investing and the Indian government needs to double its investment into health and education just as a proportion of GDP. But putting that aside, a lot of the solutions or partial solutions are coming from business. The whole communications revolution and the smartphone Government had very little to do with it, but apart from creating kind of a, 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 an open competition in the market. You were formerly in the communication sector, so I can only imagine what it looked like 20 years ago in India. Um, today is a completely new scene. People even in remote areas will, st will st soon get not only electricity, but also a 4G connection they will be able to access services that previously required days of standing in line and visiting government offices. The solar and wind um, scale-up that is happening in India, very little of it, none of it is actually done with public money. As a matter of fact, we're working with many of you in the UN and India Business Forum in trying to find similar scalable models of how to build social housing that is prefabricated, that is guaranteed with with, with a warranty that will last for 50 years minimum, that complies to all the modern standards of resilience and energy efficiency and clean cooking and sanitation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these solutions are being born in India today. I, I just want to remind many of you that perhaps are not as familiar with the, with the SDG agenda as, as some of us are. There is in the agenda a goal 12. And it's the least, um, it's the goal that people pay least attention to. It's kind of a forgotten orphan out there. But it's actually called sustainable consumption and production. Now, if you think about it for a moment, it's a convoluted way of saying a circular economy. A circular economy which produces very little waste, innovates, gives its people the quality of life and the standard of living increasingly, certainly for the middle classes, which are growing, at the level of a, let's say, a California by mid-century, but taking a fragment or, or a small portion of the finance, of the materials, and of the energy that is required while maintaining India in a, as an ecosystem, as a, as a country which has Global impacts, because the Himalayas, you know, are responsible not just for India. <laughs> they actually provide water for, I think, one quarter of humanity. So our e ecosystems, our carbon sinks, should not come into contradiction with our right to develop. I think we are increasingly finding models, both in government and in the UN, and certainly in business, where this is not a contradiction, where both things can be achieved and win-win combinations found because ultimately we may be stakeholders, we may be shareholders, but we're also citizens of this country or any other country and we are citizens of this planet. So I think we can reconcile those multiple eyes and those multiple identities in ourselves, whether we are CEOs or rich people, or poor people, or middle class people, and whether we work in companies, work in government, or work in, in the civil society sector, ultimately our interests are coincidental. And I think five to 10 years from now, a company that is only thinking about sustainability through CSR 
is already behind the eight ball. Sustainability today is a matter of core business models. Core business models. And it's becoming increasingly profitable to do that because with the social media and the transfer of information across the world, a non-sustainable company that damages the environment immediately gets a reputation and, and in many countries, and you will get there soon if not already, people will not buy or deal with that company because it becomes part of the reputational risk. And so while um, I think I'm preaching to the, to the converted already because in this room there are representatives of large Indian businesses and corporations, and I know certainly you know, the example of Tata is, is, is enlightening. They've been doing this for over 100 years, right? Um, in terms of contributing back to society and sustainability and, and donations and CSR, but increasingly integrated into the business models of their various corporations. And, and I'm sure many of you are doing the same, thinking of the same, calculating the same, and planning for the same. In India, the question is how the 80% of the economy, which is informal, gets on the same kind of thinking level. How does that man and his wife, who own a little business on the corner in Uttar Pradesh, actually get the same understanding of sustainability that increasingly you have? And that will be, I think, India's challenge. But that challenge is actually easily addressed and resolved with due time through sustainable supply chains. And maybe the last, that's where I end my, 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 my little speech to you. All of you are responsible for hundreds of thousands and millions of people in their supply chain. Whether they're your customers and they buy from you, but more importantly, whether they're contributors to your business. And I think in a very recent um, experience here with the textile industry, we are seeing a tremendous, tremendous in, in interest in, in industry in investing into their supply chains, educating their supply chains, because ultimately, as business people, what you want? You want quality, you want quantity, and you want guaranteed supply. You have to invest into your supply chains. And I think together with that investment, it shouldn't be only seeds or machinery or training. It could be also concepts of, well, if you're a leather maker, maybe you shouldn't be dumping your water into the, into the gang, uh, Ganges so that uh, the river is, is, is poisoned and dead. If you're a farmer, maybe there are alter alternatives to dumping fertilizer into your land so that the runoff, again, doesn't make it into our underground water. So I think working together with business and with business working with its own internal business models and its supply chains, a tremendous change can be achieved in a very, very, very short period of time. Let me stop here. Let me thank you for, for being here and for listening and for doing what you're already doing. Let me thank Fiki for an increasingly wonderful partnership. We are interested in, in, in what you and Fiki can deliver in terms of thinking from the private sector and where the solutions are. And we're, we're ready to learn because that's certainly not something we understand well in the UN. But we're looking forward to this partnership where we can contribute to, to each other's objectives and goals and, and certainly see many of you uh, in the UN in India Business Forum working on very concrete deals and scalable development solutions. Uh, we need that contribution and, and we hope together we can, we can scale it up in India in the coming years. So thank you very much. <laughs>